Psalm 8. Psalm 8. This was, uh, we did this back in September 18th, and we read uh, Psalm 8, meditated upon it. I know it came up in our growth group, probably came up in some other people's as well. So Psalm 8 is uh, a great psalm. It's a psalm of David. You can see messianic aspects of it, but also it's a teaching about man and uh, who we are. So we've been talking about <clears throat> God's purpose is that we might be a glorious church. This is found in Ephesians at several different places, and God's purpose is to make us like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We <clears throat> looked at Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and even before I get to that, to hold your place there in Psalm 8, I just want to look at one verse in Revelation 12, 12. So if you can look at Revelation 12, verse 12. So there were three things that uh, enable us to defeat the enemy. This is one of my favorite verses, and even uh, verse 10 is powerful, so I'll read 10, 11, and 12, but 12 is the one that I uh, want to talk about before we go to Psalm 8. So verse 10 says this, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. So that's a description of who our enemy is. Who is Satan? Satan is the accuser. He is a deceiver. It says, uh, actually verse 9, describes that the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the, whole world and uh, so he's the accuser of our brothers and he has been thrown down you know this teaching applies to us a little bit in the fact that uh, how many times do you accuse people how many times do you accuse people of coming up short of failing and uh, you're involved in accusing accusations you know, lots of accusations that fly around, accusing everybody of everything. So whose side are you on when you're the accuser? He's the accuser of the brothers. You know, you're on the devil's side. You're on Satan's side. You're joining in him when you're always uh, accusing. The Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit convicts in order to bring about repentance, to bring about transformation of life to enable us to bear the glory of Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts to build us up, to enable us to be better, to enable us to manifest glory. Accusers attack to tear down, to tear down somebody's reputation, to tear down somebody's testimony, to tear down and destroy. Don't be an accuser. Be an instrument of the devil. Uh, be an instrument of God's Holy Spirit instead of the devil. It's easy to accuse. It's a whole lot easier to bring the word of God and pray and see God building people up and restoring them. But then <clears throat> notice how that they conquered the devil. It says, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So we talked about it a lot this morning, the blood of the lamb. We were celebrating the Lord's Supper. We had the elements right before us. For us to meditate and think about the, the unleavened bread that's a picture of the body of Christ that was broken and bruised for us to heal us, to save us, to whip the devil, to give us the victory. So we talked about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second thing is the word of their testimony, by the word of their testimony. Did you know that there is incredible power when you live a life that's a testimony instead of, as Mike Johnson always said, a testimony, you know, we got enough testimonies out there. <laughs> we need some testimonies, right? Some people who are really living and glorifying Jesus Christ. So we want to be a testimony. But how many times have I heard people say, well, I just witness. I, I'm not 
very good. I'm timid. I'm shy. I'm not very good at talking to people. So I just let my light shine before people. And <clears throat> my, my testimony is my life. Well, your testimony is backed up by your life, but your testimony is what you say. When you go into a court of law and they call on you to testify, do you say stuff or you just sit there and say, well, I'm just going to let my life be my testimony. They're going to say, no, answer the question. And if you don't answer the question, you will be in contempt of court. Yeah, you can do some time. You know, you have to say, when you testify, you have to use your mouth. And this is how Satan is defeated. When we testify, when we speak forth the word. And we've been talking about in the book of Revelation that where do you find the sword? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's in the mouth of Jesus Christ. He uses that sharp sword to speak forth His Word. And so you and I have to do the same. Christ in us, that's the hope of glory. And the more that you have Jesus in you, the more that He is in control of your life, the more you should be speaking out words of testimony of the power of God and what He's done in your life and how He's changed you. You have to speak it. That's what somebody who testifies, you speak, you say what you experience, what you've seen, what you've gone through. So don't just say, hey, it's my life. My, thank God if you have a life that backs it up, but you're not going to really have a life that backs it up unless you're testifying. You know, you got to testify. You got to share with others. You have to let them know what God has done for you. Give Him the glory. You know, a lot of times when we don't, we do all kinds of good things for people and bless people, but we don't let them know that it's because of Jesus Christ, then we get the glory and they go around talking about, my, that's such a good man. He's such a good person. He's such a great guy. Hey, I want him to say, my Savior, my Lord is great. And the only way they're going to know that is if we give Him, if we ascribe to Him the glory that's due His name. So the more glory that He imparts to us, the more we will bring glory to His name by speaking forth words. Words of praise. Words of adoration. Words of acclamation. Acclaiming Him. Speaking of who He is and what He's done for us. It's pretty amazing. But then notice the third part of this. It says, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So a lot of times these Christians were giving their life. You know, we, we don't understand, but the book of uh, Revelation was written in a time of intense persecution. And some of these guys were actually paying it with their life. And they would say, if, if they did not say Caesar is Lord, they would be executed. But they would instead say Jesus is Lord. They testified. And they loved not their life, even unto death. You know, we have to be willing to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how many times I've, I've, I've been told by people, well, <laughs> you're crazy. I don't know why in the world you want to go to Mexico. They're killing people down there. Right and left. And they are. They do. But you know what? I can get killed just as easily right here in Hopeville as I can anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where I go. I've heard them say, Ah, oh, you're going to Michoacan? Have you lost your mind? The cartel's in control. You're going where? What did you say? You're going to Honduras or like uh, Miss Irene here, Sister Irene, that just went to Nicaragua. Well, the poorest country in the Central America and maybe even in the, the Western Hemisphere except for maybe Haiti. And you, you look and, and she goes. Why? Because she believes that God's big enough to take care of her. And if she dies, she just goes to heaven and she'll be crowned with even more glory up there in heaven. Amen. So, you know, that's what happens. You, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of what might happen. No, no. We don't need to love ourselves. We need to love Jesus Christ. And here it is. It says, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So sometimes, you know, we can talk about that we're willing to die, but 
the evidence of it is if every day we become living sacrifices unto the Lord and we die to ourselves. Somebody offends us and what we, we what do we do? Most of the time we react and act like that it's the most it's the unpardonable sin that you haven't recognized me in my glory. You know, and instead of dying to yourself, esteeming others better than yourself, as we've heard preached recently from this church in a powerful way. Esteem others not equal to us better. Boy, isn't that hard? Why? Because we don't like to die. Paul said, I die daily. He says, every morning when I wake up, I've got to die, deny myself. I've got to die to myself and live for Jesus Christ. And this is a guy, his pedigree is incredible of all his sufferings. You look, we read about it in 2 Corinthians. How many of you remain, remember reading that in our daily readings? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, even in 12, it's incredible the, the list of sufferings and what he went through. Have you died daily? Do you die daily? So there's probably a reason that it seems like that uh, the victory is not being won. But I'm telling you, it's not just the United States where Christianity is. Thank God it's still here in the United States. Thank God there's genuine believers. Thank God there's lovers of Jesus Christ that are on fire, that are understanding it's the blood of Jesus Christ, that have a great testimony or you're preaching and proclaiming Jesus Christ, and you're living a selfless life. You're living for the glory of God, and that's an awesome thing. But I'm telling you, all around the world, there are believers that are giving their life because they're serving Jesus Christ. And we need to learn from them and be faithful. Maybe there's a reason that we're not seeing revival. I got an encouraging text today. Uh, the kingdom builders that come and help us with our churches and helped us build a lot of churches down in Mexico. Uh, they sent me a text that a uh, preacher from a church that they helped, they went and built a church kind of out in the country, a, a little country church, and they built it and worked and went up there and ministered, and they've been praying for that church. And the pastor wrote, and he says, it's incredible today we had a, a single mom who was going to be baptized and you won't believe it. Her son got saved today. And he got baptized too. And then there were two others. He says that was four that got baptized today. That's 28 people that have been baptized. This is a country church out in the middle, smaller than Hopeville. 28 people in three months that have been baptized. Amen. You know, God's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. But let's be a part of the the victory. Let's join in on the victory. And then verse 12 is the thing that I want you to notice. Therefore, rejoice. The accuser has been thrown down. Victory is ours through Jesus. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Now, this is the book of Revelation, and you might think that this is chronological. This is the word time for chronological, that the clock is ticking, the chronological tick, clock is ticking, and it's time. But this is the word kairos, which means that it's a season of time, a very that he realizes that this is a special time, this is a, a seasonal time, and that his time is running out. And he's understanding that. The devil knows that his, you know, a lot of times we think of kairos as a great word, and it can be a great word. This is the time that God's speaking to us, God's ministering to us. But this is also a time that Satan, that the devil himself understands that he has a short time. Why do you think that the world seems like it's fallen apart? Why do you think that we have boys that are cutting off their sex organs, ladies that are cutting off. Why do you think that we have such foolishness and wickedness going on? It's this world that is like we're messed up. Why? Because the enemy is deceiving, blinding people. The devil knows that he only has a short time and he's giving it all he's got. Why do we have all the deception that's going on? Why do we have all of this stuff that's happening? We, we need to understand that the enemy is 
working overtime, trying to overthrow us. And who does he attack? He attacks man. And that's why I want you to look at Psalm 8, because I think that <clears throat> it really helps us to understand the war that's going on. And who does the, who does the devil try to take out? Is his, his war, well, I'm going to take out every species of animal that I possibly can, and so I'm just going to get rid of them. You know, back in Tennessee, there was this little fish called a snail dart that kept uh, several dams from being, uh, uh, being uh, built. They, they had them built. They had spent millions and millions of dollars, but they couldn't because there was this little snail darter. It's just a little tiny fish like this. And I was from Tennessee, and I fished in creeks all the time, and, and uh, I sang for minnows to use in fishing. And I saw snail darters all the time. And we kept saying, there's all kinds of snail darters. And before long, I don't know where, but they finally said, hey, the snail darters are not even an endangered species. They're in every little creek. They're everywhere you look. There they are. But it held up the whole thing, the whole project. But was the devil behind that? You know, is, is, he, you know, is he trying to destroy the snail darter? You know, no, the devil's not going after snail darters. He, he's going after us. He's going after human beings. His anger, his wrath is towards God. But why? Because God determined that he would save man and he would crown him with glory and that he would bring us to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. And our destiny is high. Our destiny is to bring glory to God. And he wants to use... God wants to use us and reveal his glory in and through us. And so we're who the devil attacks. You know, he's not attacking the dogs and the giraffes and all of that. He's after us. He's trying to destroy us. He's trying to take us out. But look at Psalm 8. So this is Psalm of David. It says this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. In 2 Corinthians, we really studied a lot about the glory of God. If you were reading it, you noticed that, that we're to be transformed into the image of His Son, that we're to give Him glory. And just for you to see it with clarity, hang on to Psalm 8. We're going to get there, I promise. But uh, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This again is a passage that uh, we read uh, together and it really ministered and it was mentioned several times in, in our growth group. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and it says this, and we all, not just Moses, we all with unveiled face entering into his presence, beholding what? The glory of the Lord. Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So what's God's purpose for us to transform us, to take us from one degree of glory to more, to take us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ? How many of you look, when you look in the mirror, do you see Jesus Christ in all of his glory? <laughs> Probably not. That means that there's still some more degrees of glory that God wants to take us. He wants to take us higher. He wants to reveal his glory in us. So it's we all. This is a privilege of every one of us. This isn't just for Pastor Moore. This isn't for the pastors and deacons only. This isn't for the Sunday school teacher. This is for all. We all. He's writing to the Corinthian church. We all, not like in the Old Testament, Moses came down with the glory of God shining in his life. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. If you haven't noticed it, the Trinity is incredible. 
It's just like I've said, the word is paraclete. John 14 through 16, the word paraclete is the word for the Holy Spirit. He's a helper. He's a comforter. He's a counselor. He's an advocate. He's a our lawyer. He, he comes along and he teaches us and, and he helps us. And he is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I'll send the Holy Spirit who is another one just like me and I'm going to send him and it's necessary for me to go away because if I don't go away, you're only going to have my physical presence. But if I go away, I can send you the Holy Spirit and all of you will have my presence in you. I'm not making this up. This is God's word. This is God's truth. This is what he's saying. Do you see it? God is in the business of conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. And it's through the Lord who is the Spirit. Who is the Lord? Jesus is Lord. Who is the Spirit? So in John 14, 16, paraclete is the Holy Spirit. In 1 John chapter 2, paraclete is Jesus Christ, our advocate. So it's exactly what Jesus said. I'll send another one just like me who will live in you. And so in 1 John chapter 2, he's our advocate. He's in heaven and on earth is the Holy Spirit. And 1 John talks about the Holy Spirit as well. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So when Jesus is at work in your life, the Holy Spirit also is at work in your life. Jesus is interceding at the Father's right hand. The Holy Spirit's interceding from inside of us. And I've mentioned this over and over again, but you need to note it. Naos is the Greek word, not for the building, not for the temple building. Naos is the, the holy, the holy of holy, the holiest of holies. It's the place where God's presence dwells. Right? This is where the Ark of the Covenant is, which is synonymous with the presence of God. And so this passage of Scripture, and you tie them all together, we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God comes into us, the holy place. And so He doesn't reside in a, in a temple, a building that's built by men, but now He resides in our hearts. And His business is to make us holy like His Son was holy. And Jesus Christ was the Word, become flesh, lived among us, and fleshed out to us what being, being like God is really like. Look at Jesus. That's your pattern. That's your example. Follow Him. Walk in His steps. Draw near to Him. Get in the Word. Allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in your life. It's this combination of Word and Spirit, the Holy Spirit taking the words and making them come alive in our hearts to where you walk and you hear and listen and obey and do what God tells you to do. It's powerful. But then notice 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and because of time we'll jump down to verse 3, 4, 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. There's power in the gospel. This morning we talked about Romans chapter 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called. And then we had those four questions. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of God. There's power in the gospel. And yet it says this, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. If you can't see it, Mark it down, you're perishing, and you need Jesus Christ. I mean, you can jump through all the hoops. You can ABC it, one, two, three it. You can do all of that. It's, that's not what salvation is. I don't know how we went from knowing me, believing in me, to these little formulas that many times people can pray, and they're no closer to the kingdom of God than they've ever been. It's not a, a prayer by road. It's not just learning doctrine it's knowing Jesus Christ having an encounter with him where he comes into your life 
and transforms you and changes you. If the gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, all of this has to do with sight. This has to do with, with seeing. Did you know that you cannot see if it's totally dark? Do you know that? You ever try, you ever gotten in a tunnel? I took Mike Johnson, I've told you about this. I took Mike Johnson in the tunnel back in Tennessee, and it's got this big curve in it. So you go about midway, and you can't see light at the end of either, either plate. You're in absolute total darkness. And that's what hell's going to be like. And I'm telling you, we turned the lights off. And I don't know how long it was, but it was only seconds before people were saying, turn the lights back on. They were nervous, sweating like crazy. I mean, total darkness. It's terrifying. And you can't see a thing. You can't see without light. Jesus is the light. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. It's a glorious gospel because it brings God's glory into our lives and changes us, and gives us a hope, gives us a future. Notice the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Jesus, it says here of Christ, which means the anointed one, and is speaking of his human terms, prophet, priest, and king. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So what did Paul believe in order to be saved? that you had to receive Jesus Christ as your king, as your prophet, and as your priest. You couldn't rip off part of him. You received Jesus Christ, Christ in his glory. He is the image of God. And this is it. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. Paul says, I'm not somebody that you bow down to. I'm not somebody that you have to uh, please me. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And my greatest joy is to lift up Jesus and preach his gospel and proclaim him to the Gentiles and also to the Jews, to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. What's your greatest joy? When the gospel penetrates your life, it changes you. And it should, your greatest joy should be the same thing, to see your children saved, to see your family saved, to see others saved, to proclaim and preach the glory of Jesus Christ. Man, I've been praying that this will, this will come true, this, this will, that this will open some eyes. I mean, I don't want us to end, come to the end of our life and end up in hell instead of in heaven because we haven't seen the glorious light of Jesus Christ and we haven't looked to him for God who said let light shine out of darkness do you see it you can't see anything in total darkness he has shined out of the darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ hey this sounds like a whole lot more, uh, all who believe must confess. <laughs> now, I'm not against some of those principles, but you've missed out. I mean, it doesn't just it doesn't sound like the gospel that Paul's preaching. This is gospel. This is God's light, bringing light into the darkness, getting the sin out of our life, getting God's glory in us. Oh, this is a powerful gospel. This is a gospel that transforms. This is a gospel that saves. You've got to believe 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. We proclaim not ourselves Jesus Christ as Lord, for God shines in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We look to Him and we are transformed. God works in us and we become more filled with His glory. Don't forget, all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. So what's He got to do to save us? Get His glory in us. And how does He do that? By entering into our lives. Entering into us and changing us and transforming us. And man, we've got 8 to 10, 12 weeks that we're really focusing on this, but it should be the focus of our life every day. Because this is what it's all about. Getting into the presence of Jesus and manifesting His glory. But notice, verse 7 says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. That's the problem. This old body... It, it's learned to sin from early age. It's learned how to do all kinds of sinful things. And it weighs us down. But notice it says to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The only way that we can mortify the deeds of the body is through God, through His Spirit, through His Word, through the blood of Christ, through the gospel working in our lives. We can't do it ourselves. Man, we're weak. We, we can get crushed, perplexed, driven to despair, persecuted. But notice we're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So I don't have time to, tonight. Well, I might have a, a time to do that. But let me just mention what is one of the mysteries? The mystery, one of the mysteries that the Bible talks about, that Paul talks about, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. And three and four of Second Corinthians, Paul teaches us how that glory gets into us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. The more that he's in us, manifesting himself in us, the more we will reveal and Exalt the glory of God. Amen. So let's go back to Roman, uh, Roman Psalm 8. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. You remember Jesus quoted that passage? It's uh, pretty powerful uh, how Jesus believed the word of God and lived the word of God and preached it and proclaimed it. And uh, we need to understand what he's up to in our life. God has determined to bring his sons to glory. God is determined to make us like Jesus Christ. This is what he's going to do. And it's like in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Jesus said it out of the mouths of babes that he can ordain praise to him. You have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. God can take us and transform us into his children and grow us and change us and use us to rout the enemy. Now notice verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers. All right. So you're talking about light years and light years and light years and all of the planets and all of the galaxies, you know, the, the universe and all of its glory. And that's called the work of his fingers. <laughs> that's incredible. I mean, you know, that big old star, that 
big dog star, can't have, however big it is. I mean, it's so massive. And that's just one little star in, in one uh, galaxy. And uh, it's the work of his fingers. The moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Now, yes, this has some messianic aspect of Jesus, but this is talking about man and woman. What is man that you are mindful? Isn't it amazing that God looks in this vast universe and looks down and takes note of us? Isn't it amazing that God has determined that he's going to make us look like his son, Jesus Christ? Isn't it amazing that he determined to send his son and allow him to die for us, to change us and to transform us? What an amazing thing. What is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man? He says, look at the creation. Look how massive it is. Maybe David didn't understand the bigness. He didn't have the telescope. But somehow he looked at the skies and he says, look at all of that glory. Maybe he didn't have any clue of how far it was but, he's, but he understood the bigness of the world and the littleness of man. And he says, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Even little babies, babes, and infants, little babies that are nursing and can't take care of themselves. Verse 5, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. This actually is the word Elohim, uh, there, there are at least some texts that uh, call this Elohim. And it used to say in uh, the old versions, it says then the angels. But it's been a little better than the heavenly beings, but that's not even really it. You have made him a little lower than Elohim. Elohim is the name for the triune God. You've made him a little lower. So in the order of things, you have Elohim, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then at one time it was archangels and angels, but God says, no, it's going to be the Trinity, me, Elohim, and then it's going to be man. And the angels are ministering spirits to minister to us. And oh my goodness, it made Satan, Lucifer, mad. Now this is me interjecting some things. But you can see why he so hates. Who did he attack? Genesis 3. Who did he go after? He went after Adam and Eve. He was trying to destroy man because God says, I'm going to take men and women and I'm going to change them and I'm going to make them like me and I'm going to reveal my glory and I'm going to use them and care for them. And it's an incredible statement. But notice what it says. You have made him a little lower than, the, than Elohim. Elohe is the word singular, so we know it's not God. It's Elohim. It's plural for God, uh, it's, but it's singular. One God, but Elohim, plural. And then it says this, you have given him or you have crowned him with glory and honor. So what did he crown us with? With glory and honor. So God says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're just little. I mean, have you ever seen an earthen vessel? <laughs> I've had them. I dropped one. Dr. Cheatwood had given it to me. This is a gift for you. I just want you to have this. And, you know, you can always think of me. And Fumble Fingers me dropped it. Because smash, it just smashed into a thousand pieces. <laughs> I'm going, oh. <laughs> Scoop it up. Okay. 
And that's how we are, man. We're so broken. Humpty Dumpty can't put us together, you know. But God can. God can take an earthen vessel that's so broken, so fragile, and we're broken by sin. And yet he can say, I'm going to crown you with glory and honor. Isn't that amazing? You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Whenever you go to Sea World and see those animals that seem to be trained, you know, every once in a while they get their revenge and kill a trainer that they're kind of mad at, but most of the time they do what they're told to do. And you look at them and you're saying, how in the world can we have control? How in the world can, you know, how can you put a little bitty baby on top of a big horse and, uh, and that little child can control that horse and can ride that horse? It's amazing. A little two-year-old, three-year-old can, can ride horses with a lot of amount of ability. And yet that massive animal, you might even, was it a Clydesdale? Who, who got a Clydesdale? Tammy, somebody was riding a Clydesdale. Judy, yeah, Judy Abadi got on one of those big Clydesdales. She wasn't supposed to hurt herself, you know. Well, thank God she didn't get hurt, but that's a big old horse, you know. But isn't it amazing that uh, in all of the things that he made, huge, massive animals, and the sun, the moon, the, the, all of this, the heavenly stuff that he's made, that he cares about us, and he says, hey, I'm going to put my glory in you. And I'm going to change you, and I care about you. And I'm even going to allow my son to die on the cross. Suspended between heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, as he worked out our salvation on the cross, as he bore our sins and his body on the tree. And it was an incredible, glorious interchange where he took our sins upon him, and he gave us his righteousness and saved us. And God says, I love you too much to allow you to stay as you are. And I'm going to put my glory in you. And I'm going to make you like Christ. And I'm telling you, that calls us to get into the word, to submit to God, to seek him with all of our heart, and understand what Christianity is all about. It's a life of commitment. It's a life not that we only serve God every once in a while, but it's our life. He is our life. He's our all in all. Christ is above all. Let's worship him. Let's give him the glory that he deserves. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. We pray that we might receive this teaching. It sounds strange when we see so little of godliness, but it's the power that you have, the power of the cross, the power of the blood, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And we just pray that that power would work and you would get the sin out of our life and help us to glorify you with all of our being. Just bring about revival in our hearts and we'll give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
in there. The Bible says that you bring out of treasures from the old and treasures from the new. And God is doing that with some of these great hymns of the faith. Everybody's glory bears God's glory. He wants to reveal his glory in and through you. Amen. Let's give him the glory. Let's praise him. Let's let's seek him. More of him. That means you know why? Because it means less of us. And the less of us that there is, there's more glory. And we're the one that drags the glory down. When I, when, it, when I jump up and promote me, I'm taken away from God's glory. But when it's all God, and I'm an earthen vessel, and I don't matter, but He does, that's when God gets the glory. Amen. Let's give Him the glory, because He's worthy. All right. Everybody glad you came? All right.
will be dismissed in prayer. Steve Butler, would you close us out in a word of prayer, please?